and thank you for joining. Um, good. My name is uh, Alain, Elena. Uh, that is the, the lady with the nice uh, headphones uh, on. Um, I am at uh, Heistat at Heistat.com uh, and Elena is at bio at Heistat.com. Though I don't think you're in Spain right now, are you, no, Elena? No, no, I've been, I've been traveling from North to traveling? South America. <laughs> uh, well, I'm in, in, in Scotland. Um, today is a uh, zero inflated DLM and a GLMMs. Uh, so who are we, very briefly? Uh, we, we started uh, writing a couple of books for Springer in 2006, 2007. They became a little bit too popular, or Springer made too much money out of that. So we decided to write our own uh, book series uh, as self-publishing authors. And that was, yeah, it was a nice, nice experience. That's because you guys keep on asking questions and we don't know the answer. So we look it up and we write some text around it and voila, you have a new book. Um, the, the one we're going to talk about today or a part of that is uh, zero inflation. Uh, then before uh, COVID, we used to do 20 courses, 25 courses per year uh, in very nice places. Uh, nowadays, that is all online, uh, but I think that is equally, equally nice. Uh, especially because I got two little little kitties uh, running around. Uh, but then, yeah, I think it's time to do on-site things again. Uh, we try to avoid doing statistical consultancy. Are you busy enough? Uh, you're a biologist, Elena. You, you, you're you the nice one. Uh, <laughs> I'm a statistician. I try to be nice. Um, and what else am I going to say? Yeah, what are we going to do today? Outline. Uh, first, uh, going to talk about uh, a little bit of a revision of Poisson negative binomial distributions. Uh, then uh, you, uh, you're going to do that, Elena. Yeah. Uh, okay. GLM. And then I will take it over with zero inflated models. Yes, this is for count data, but where possible, I will also try to give you some hints, some suggestions what you can do for uh, continuous uh, zero inflated data. And then we're going to do a detailed example using some R codes, using a owl begging behavior uh, data set. And if you want to dive deeper in this stuff, then it's either that one. Now, there are always people among you who are quite unfortunate that they have a zero inflation, they got spatial correlation, they've got a temporal correlation. Uh, yeah, you can combine it all. That's all possible. Uh, but before you know, you're doing very difficult things. Okay, uh, let me close this. Uh, you do have the PDF files of this, uh, but you can also watch. So let me then close, uh, open the second uh, crazy presentation. So this is. Uh, you, Elena? Yes, uh, that's correct, Alain. And um, well, uh, again, thanks uh, everybody for joining us. Again, thanks Jordi and Dennis for uh, doing all the work for us. And now it's, uh, it's time to start with, uh, with this talk. And as Alain said, well, we're going to deal a little bit with uh, set of inflated models. But before you dig into SIP and SAPS models, you need to be familiar with certain type of distributions that will allow you to jump into these set of inflated models. So that's the reason why we always try to work a step by step. And whenever we teach these topics, we start doing uh, an introduction about the, uh, or describe the most common distributions that we're going to use uh, for later on being able to use in a SIP context. So, um, in this uh, case, I would like to do a revision of Poisson. We're going to start with count data, discrete data. So therefore we're going to start with a revision of Poisson distribution. And then we're going to discuss uh, negative binomial and generalized Poisson. And finally, Bernoulli distribution. As you will see later on, Elaine will explain you that a SIP model will be comprised of a 
a count part and a present absence part. And therefore you need to be familiar with both legs because later on we're going to combine Poisson with Bernoulli or negative binomial with Bernoulli, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the reason why we need to be familiar with both legs before we start doing more fancy things. Now we incorporated also these GB uh, distributions because they're also available uh, in R that you can you can implement that and it's also very handy when you have problems not only when you do when you have over dispersion but also when you have under dispersion. Anyway, if you open a book on a general GLM knowledge, you will see that everybody will describe these three main steps. So you first need to deal with the distribution. So you collect your data, you have your Y data, number of fish, number of birds, whatever. I need to allocate a distribution to your response. Of course, you're going to collect information such as covariates or explanatory variables, and that will be part of what you what we call the uh, predictor function. And later on, we need to make a link between the expected value of the distribution and the predictor function. So that's the reason why in this presentation, we're going to deal a little bit with the first step, meaning the distribution, and later on, we're going to work towards the GLM models and later on, SIG models. So um, we're going to, you're going to see that we're going to have finally an application, the OWL data Alan was talking about, and we're going to use the uh, GLM TMB package that is quite handy uh, to be able to fit these models. Okay, so um, the uh, nowadays there was a time that we were struggling a little bit in teaching SIP models because we were not, uh, we're not having enough, uh, well, software was not completely work out and thanks to GLM TMB, that package is really fantastic and is gaining popularity and therefore it's easier uh, to implement these type of models using frequentist techniques. Uh, but of course you can rely on Bayesian techniques as well. Now, one, um, a very important piece of advice, we never start uh, applying a zero inflated models. We always start simple, simple as first we try a simple ordinary GLM Poisson and we, our strategy is to build up the models accordingly. We always learn from submodels. So the idea is to start simple, fit a model, apply model validation, learn from the model validation pictures, and then you can find solutions accordingly. Okay, so this is... Uh, how we're going to play in this case, this game, and how we're going to analyze the uh, final data set. Okay, so, uh, and the other thing is, uh, people think that if you have lots of zeros, you have to jump immediately into zero inflation, but be careful about that because you may have covariates that can explain the excessive number of zeros, and you can easily implement a GLM Poisson or negative binomial, and then you say, job done, and I don't need to dig into all these new distributions. So let's build up everything step by step. Poisson. So when we start teaching in simple courses, a Poisson distribution, well, um, I, I would like to introduce an example. So suppose that you um, you want to go to uh, an area. In this case, we go to Canada, we have cliffs, and then we have puffins. And suppose you want to count the number of nests per plot. Okay, so we are going to have uh, counts. And our starting point, of course, is going to be a Poisson density function. Okay, so uh, suppose, and then in the next slide, we have suppose that based on experience, because you have done this or these people have done this for a while, suppose that we have uh, that in a three by three meter plot, we count an average of five nests every time we go there. Okay, this is based on past experience. So. We don't expect to observe exactly five nests, but maybe we're going to count zero, one, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. So by using a statistical distribution, we can answer questions as follows. So what is the probability that we're going to go back to the field and we're going to observe zero, one, five, ten nests? So given the fact that the mean is five, again, I can quantify these probabilities and we're going to use a statistical distribution. So in the next slide, I have an equation. I have a formula there. So you, I'm pretty sure you came across with this expression that you see in line 3.1. Uh, 
and it says probability of y equal y given the mean is equal to mu to the power y times e to the power minus mu divided by y factorial. Well, y factorial is, we talk about high school mathematics. There you have how much it is, a five factorial. By definition, zero factorial is one, one factorial is one. And then you, you have the mean. And then, so because y is the number of puffing nest, mean is, uh, mu is the mean. And with all that information, I can now stick it in a number and I can calculate the probability of, for instance, going back tomorrow to the field, given the fact that the mean is five, I can calculate the probability of finding zero nest, 0 0.06, one, five, 10, et cetera, et cetera. What you do with all these numbers is very easy if I can plot those uh, probabilities. So I have, I have a sketch, three different scenarios. Those are three different Poisson distributions for a mean, equal phi, what is the example of the puffins? Maybe we have a different scenario where the mean is 10 or even the mean is 15, 100, whatever. What you see, if you go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side is that as long as you increase the mean, you increase the variation. And this is the characteristic of this distribution. It has only one parameter, the mean is the variance. So we say, we assume that the uh, number of nests, the variable nests will follow a Poisson distribution and uh, in which the mean and the variance is given by that expression. So the expected value of the nest is equal to the variance equal mu. So only one parameter. And I goes, in this case, is a very small data set. We have only 38 observations. So I goes from one to 38. Okay, this is just a, a quick overview to refresh your memory and uh, what a Poisson distribution, how it looks like. Then a good competitor, and probably the one that in most of the cases the colleges will go to is the uh, negative binomial. Again, so uh, as we said before, for in the majority of the ecological data sets, you have the situation that the mean variance relationship imposed by the Poisson distribution will not hold. So Poisson is not a very uh, friendly, just to mention like this, it's not a very friendly distribution something that you're going to use all the time for analyzing ecological data. So there's a reason why in most of the cases when you start trying a GLM Poisson distribution of data, um, you will encounter problems. And if you encounter problems, you will see at the end of the day that your parameters may be biased and all your conclusions are going to be wrong. So if the variance is larger than the mean, then we can rely on a second option, which is called the negative binomial. Now, as you can see, the formula you have in equation 3.3, we have a new component. It says expected value is the mu is equal to the mean. The variance is equal to the mean plus mean to the power two divided by theta. So it's a new parameter. Now we have the mean and the theta. And the theta, depending on the value of the theta, for instance, if theta is very large compared to mu to the power two, the second component in that equation will be close to zero. And if that happens, then you go back to the situation in which the variance mean is uh, the, the variance is equal mu. So then you go back to the Poisson. So there I have the uh, have a sketch of that scenario. So depending on the value of the theta, you may encounter uh, different, uh, you may have different options. And we illustrated the situation here. Because what, what we did here, we have three columns. So we have three diff nine different pictures, nine different distributions. And uh, we have by column, we have different some different mean values, 5, 10, and 15. And by row, we change the value of theta. So if you look at the bottom, theta is very large. That was the scenario was sketching. If theta is very large compared to mu to the power 2, then you go back to Poisson. So this is pretty much like a Poisson distribution. Then theta is one, you see, then you get a different distribution, different shapes. And if you look at the top, then you have the, uh, the scenario where theta is very small. What you see here is quite characteristic, a large spike at zero. So when we look at, this, uh, uh, at these pictures, so it doesn't come to surprise that if you were to have excessive number of zeros, maybe the negative binomial can cope with this scenario. Now, uh, as you can see, if let's concentrate on the, the one in the middle, Alain, maybe you can help me highlight in the, the, at the bottom. So um, if you look at the scenario where the mean is 10 and theta is uh, 1,000, 
you can have, we can see here, we can have data on the right hand side of 10 because 10 is the, uh, the mean. Uh, and but you can also have data on the left hand side, okay? And uh, the data, uh, data are sort of symmetric around both sides. But if we go a little bit further up and if we select that picture that I landed there, the one that says mu equal 10 and theta is equal one, then we have lots of values lower than 10 and a few big ones, okay? And it becomes even more extreme if you go to the upper uh, picture where it says mean is 10 and theta is zero one. Uh, there you have that maybe only a very few, you have only a very few large ones and you have lots of values on the left-hand side, okay? So what we can conclude and this is the interesting aspect of this distribution is that if you were to have absurd data that are highly skewed at certain covariate values, the negative binomial is a very good option. And uh, we also need to consider that if you were to sketch the uh, fitted values of the model, it does not necessarily mean that you're going to have, or you're going to have an exponential relationship, of course, and it does not necessarily mean you're going to have equal number of uh, values the above and below that line. That is what happens when you fit a linear regression model, uh, but that is not necessarily the case because this may, this distribution may, may not be uh, symmetric. Okay, then we have uh, a good competitor is this generalized Poisson distribution, a GP. Uh, this is perhaps uh, a distribution that not everybody will be familiar with, and as I said before, it's a very good competitor for negative binomial because you can target situations in which you have over models that are going to be over dispersed, but you can also target situations in which you're going to have models that are going to be under dispersed. So for, for years, we've been struggling in fitting uh, GP models. Uh, now with a GLM TMB, it's very easy to implement this distribution. And for those, for instance, that it's, it's not very it's not very likely that you're going to find a situation where you're going to encounter under dispersion. The most likely scenario in ecology is over dispersion. But for those that, for instance, ornithologists that work with data sets such as clutch size data, uh, well, those models they tend to be when you count the number of hex, those type of uh, uh, when you implement those models, they tend to be under dispersed. So now, welcome back. We can use a GP distribution. And of course, there are different ways, depending on which book you're going to rely on. There are different ways of expressing the mean and the variance of a variable that will follow a GP distribution. And here you have a expected values equal mu. The variance is given by that expression. Depending on the package, we simplify the whole thing by the same mu, e, mu times theta or phi, whatever you want to call. And depending on the scenario, depending on the value of the, of the theta, you may, you may convert into Poisson. Maybe the next one, Alain, is, is easier. The, maybe um, if theta is equal, um, if that one is equal one, then we have the scenario uh, that will obtain Poisson. If that phi or theta is larger than one, we assume over dispersion. And if it is lower than that, we assume under dispersion. So that's the reason why we're saying that this one can cope with different type of scenarios. And if you don't have massive over dispersion, maybe the GP can perform even better than the negative binomial. So you have uh, different options. And here I wanted to sketch some of the scenarios with GP uh, density functions. We use, uh, we're using the vegan package. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, DGM was one cannot uh, allow us to visualize the under dispersion situation. But what I did, again, I fitted uh, three uh, for three different scenarios where the mean goes from 5, 10, 15, and different theta values of five values of 1, 2, and 5. So the one that is at the top is pretty much the scenario of the uh, Poisson distribution. And if phi is 2 or 3, as you can see, we can map the, the, the curves are getting wider and wider. So when we have this scenario of over dispersion, and if you have a small amount of over dispersion, maybe this is a very good, uh, a very good competitor, as I said before, uh, instead of using negative binomial. Finally, we have to deal with the second leg. So a SIP will be combined. It will be a combination of 
Poisson, negative and homial GB plus Bernoulli. So that's the reason why we also have to refresh your memory of what you do when you have to analyze present absence. So you may have present absence data only and you have to rely on Bernoulli distribution. So say that you're not interested in the counts themselves, in the quantitative aspect of the data, you're interested in the qualitative aspect of the data, you convert everything into present absence, yes, no. And then we know for sure that we can use a Bernoulli distribution that uh, can be expressed by that equation that you see there, 3.5. So we say that expected values of nest is pi, pi takes the same role as mu, the probability of finding nest, and the variance is given by that expression. Okay, so um, this is a, a quick overview of the essential, we say essential distributions that are going to use for simple uh, set of inflated models. Now we we're talking about three different steps, the idea of having the response. So now we define, so you collect data and the first thing you have to do is define, depending on the nature of your response variable, you need to find a distribution that can later on allow you to run the corresponding model. But now we have to work towards a, a, a GLM, a GLM model, starting with a Poisson GLM, and we're going to use this puffing data. Okay, this is a real data set from a long time ago in Canada. So uh, they were looking at factors that were explaining breeding success in these animals, and they collected, they accounted for four different covariates. Just for simplicity, we're going to use only one, the last one, distance uh, from the cliff edge, for two different reasons. From the uh, from the pedagogical point of view, it's easier to explain things with only one covariate, but at the same time, we have only 35 parameters, 35 observations, and there is there is rule of thumb that you need to have at least 20, 25 observations per parameter. So I don't want to overcomplicate things. So predictor function, we have to specify the covariate part of the model. We call this eta. So that uh, symbol there is eta, the Greek letter eta equal intercept plus beta times distance. So this is my, um, as I said before, my predictor function. I have the y data predictor function, and now we need to specify the relationship between the mean of the distribution mu and the predictor function eta. And here is where you have to uh, think what are, what are the options that you have available for you. Um, default settings are going to be lock link function, but you can also use identity link. And I think in the next, uh, in the next slide, we have, uh, yeah, we say identity link will be uh, new equal eta. Problem is that if you deal with counts with discrete data, this option is valid in those scenarios where you're not going to expect negative fitted value. So most likely a scenario, default settings use a lock link function and that will ensure thanks to the this construction, new equal e to the power intercept plus uh, beta times covariate, that construction will ensure that your expected values are going to be strictly positive. Okay, so because you don't want to make predictions of having minus 20 number of nests. Okay, so working towards the GLM, and that is the, the, first, the first three lines. This is what I will write down in a paper. We always encourage people to write down these equations in a paper because then as a reader, you know what you're doing. We say that nest i, the y data is Poisson distributed with parameter mu, expected value is equal mu, equal the variance. Log mu, which is the same as me saying mu, u equal e to the power, intercept plus beta times distance, beta times covariate. Now, getting a little bit of working knowledge, we can estimate the parameters of this model using the GLM function, plain GLM, and you use that construction that we saw there. Okay, so what is the first thing you fit your first GLM Poisson? What is the first thing you have to rely on? So you have to verify that the mean variance relationship will hold. So we need to account or calculate the so-called dispersion statistics. So that is going to be a formula, a ratio. If that value is one, then you're okay. If it is larger than one, we suspect over dispersion, lower than one, we suspect under dispersion. So what are the components of that formula? Well, we need to account to calculate the dispersion statistic. We need to calculate the Pearson residuals, observed data minus fitted data divided by the square root of the variance. Once I have the Pearson residuals, once I have the sample size, once I have the number of parameters, the formula itself will 
calculate the sum of the square Pearson residuals divided by sample size minus the number of parameters. In this part, for this particular data set, the value is 1.97. So it is definitely larger than one. Well, one of the, every time we teach this type of uh, models, people are always asking the same type of question. How much larger than one do we have to, or in which scenario do we have to pay attention? If, if it's not exactly one, because you may get a scenarios where the value is 1.2, 1.5, 1.6. What at which point are you going to make corrections? At which point you're going to think about doing something else? Well, actually, out of the blue, to be honest, we wouldn't be able to answer that question. The, the right question would the right answer to that question would be, I don't know, because it depends on the sample size, it depends on the number of covariates, the type of covariates, so it depends on the model. So what we can what we can see or the way we can answer the question is as follows. What we can do is do a simulation study. So the concept is, is very simple. So you have a data set, okay, like the buffing data. Then you have a model. You apply your GLM model as we specify in the previous slide. From the model, you can simulate, let's say, 1,000 or maybe for a paper, 10,000 set of new number of nests. And for each simulated data set, you're going to calculate the dispersion statistics. And with those dispersion statistics values, you can make a histogram of that. And hopefully those 1,000 or 10,000 dispersion statistic values that you get from your simulations are going to be comparable to the one that you found in your original model. So as you can see here, I have plotted, we, we, we did a simulation with Southern. So, so we have Southern data set and we calculated Southern times new dispersion statistic values. But you don't get exactly, you know, all the values are not going to be exactly one. So the majority will be around one, but you can get values such as 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, even 1.5. And probably in, uh, in only very few occasions, you get a value that is larger than two but that value is going to be labeled as rather extreme. So the value that we found that was 1.97 is definitely very, very extreme. So we can conclude that we see over dispersion. But again, this is a data specific picture. Maybe if you increase the number of observations, so if you came up with a different data set, like having a hundred and thousand observations, then those histograms perhaps are going to going to be pulled towards one. So you, the, the, the range you will tolerate probably is going to be smaller. So that's the reason why it depends on the model fit. It depends on the sample size. And as I said before, this is a data specific question, meaning that if you obtain a dispersion statistic of 1.6, maybe it will comply with the Poisson distribution in your scenario, but may, may not comply in my scenario, okay? So that's the reason why we encourage people to do this simulation study. Of course, you're not going to probably spend time doing all these simulations if a priori you find a value of a dispersion status value that is 20, 50. So there is no point of doing this type of simulations because you know a priori that your model is going to be over dispersed. Anyway, um, in this case, we, um, we conclude that we have um, over dispersion and uh, the question at this point that you have to answer yourself is why do we have, so now you have to go deeper in trying to understand why you have over dispersion, okay? So you're not going to jump immediately into a different distribution without knowing which component is causing or what is causing over dispersion. So at this point, you have to do a detailed model validation and we have to check for nonlinear patterns, dependency, spatial dependency, temporal dependency, et cetera, et cetera. And even if the dispersion statistic of a classical GLM Poisson will indicate that there is no over dispersion, you still need to apply a, a detailed model validation before you present your final result. And in this, uh, um, in this slide, we have all the steps that we summarize all the steps that we always do when we teach, we say, well, okay, Model validation is something that you have to pay attention and you have to extract the residuals, plot the residuals versus fitted values, plot the residuals versus each covariate in the model, each covariate not in the model, because maybe it's a GLM Poisson, but 
you plot the residues again, a covariate that you didn't include, and you see a beautiful nonlinear patterns, and then you have to go into GAMS, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to put emphasis on covariates in the model and covariates not in the model. Plot residuals versus um, uh, X, Y positions, so to deal with later on with the spatial correlation, temporal aspect, and check also for zero inflation problems. So thanks to all these simulations that I have already done, maybe um, what you can what you can do at this point, uh, well, first, I have these uh, pictures, residuals versus fitted values. Within the majority of that gradient, I don't see a cone-shaped pattern indicating massive dispersion. Those points that you see there, those, those, are, those are the zeros. So you don't want to have those bands dominating your pictures because that may be an indication for seed inflation, so something that we have to deal later on. Then I plot the residuals versus distance, which is the covariate that I was picking up for this uh, analysis, and we see clear indication for nonlinearity. Then, then Pearson residuals versus grass, that is okay. And then observe versus fitted values. You pretty much, if you if you have a good fit, you would like to have perhaps depending on the scenario points that are going to lie within that line. Seed inflation problems. Okay, I, I'm using again my um, my simulation um, my simulation results. And what I can do, I can calculate what else can I do with those thousand simulated data sets? Well, I can calculate the number of zeros in each of the simulated data sets, and I can compare with the number of zeros that I obtain in my original data set. So that big uh, dot in black, it's indicating that in the original data set, we have 13 zeros. And what we have in, in that frequency plot, we see how often we find three zeros in a data set, one, five, seven, et cetera. But for sure, if we simulate it from, if you simulate data from the model and if we assume a Poisson distribution, the simulated data can cope with 13 zeros, 20, whatever. So it's an indication that we have uh, seed inflation. So we conclude that we have uh, over dispersion and we detected two main problems. The model cannot cope with excess number of zeros based on those simulations uh, pictures. And there is also an indication of a nonlinear pattern uh, with um, the covariate distance to the edge of the uh, cliff. So two different problems that we have to address. Okay, so, and, um, and now what do you do? Well, before, before you start thinking of moving on, before you start thinking of changing the distribution, it is highly recommended that you sketch the fitted values. We always put emphasis in sketching the fitted values, even if this model you know a priori that is not going to work, but I, I will try to get familiar with the model fit so that I can disentangle the components that later on will allow me to think about uh, how I'm going to improve uh, my final uh, attempt. So what I'm doing here, because it's only one covariate, I'm sketching the fitted value. So number of nests, so the, the line in the middle, that is the fitted line. I have in gray the 95% confidence intervals around the, the mean. The, those dots are the observed values, okay? And then we have the covariance distance to the cliff. Maybe it's better to look at the second picture because I can now rely on a three-dimensional picture. And what I have, again, I have my, my covariate data distance to the cliff. And in the third axis, I have the density curve. So what, I, what I'm doing is that every covariate value at every distance to the edge value, I'm superimposing a Poisson density curve. And I have the, and I'm superimposing also the, um, the raw data. So what you can see, um, and this is the, the characteristic of the Poisson, when I have a distance values, very low distance value, the range, the, the range that this uh, distribution is covering is very wide, but as long as you increase the value of distance to the edge, then you see that the curves are getting uh, less wider. And if you look at the, um, the last two, there is where you see a cloud of points. Those are the zeros. 
So I'm not worried about the last one. I'm worried about that one, the one that Alain is highlighting. So it seems to me that those zeros, they don't comply with the Poisson distribution. That's the reason why we're talking about zero issues here, so zero inflation issues here. So apparently, at that specific covariate value, those zeros, they don't comply with the Poisson distribution and can be labeled later on as excessive number of zeros. The other thing I can do, I can do a, a third picture, and this will allow me to, again, sketch the fitted values. So I have the, the line itself, it's a fitted line. I have the dots in black are the observed values. And I, what I did here, I picked um, 20 distance value, and at every distance values, I'm uh, simulating new number of nests. So using the mean value. So for instance, for the first, the one that Alain is highlighting there, the mean is 17, I think, something like that. So using the r plus function, I can generate new y data, and I'm simulating 50 values. So for every specific distance value. And I'm doing the same at the right-hand side. So at every uh, covariate value. And again, if you look, if you concentrate, if you put your, um, if you zoom in where it says distance equal 40, there is where everything I have simulated. So those zeros that you see there, they don't comply with the Poisson distribution. So this is something that we have to, uh, definitely, you need to investigate. Elena, can I just add something? Yes. If you were to do this 250, if you were to simulate 250 values, and if you compare the observed data with the simulated ones, and if you were to calculate the fraction of the simulated values smaller than the observed one, you're very close to scaled quantile residence. And why do I say that? Because in two or three slides, you will see the phrase DH ARMA, which is using scaled quantile residuals. But that is what it's actually doing. Simulate and compare simulated data with the observed value and express that as a fraction that is smaller. Now you know what DH ARMA is doing. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Alain. And the other thing is, uh... When we say, okay, time now it's time for a change. Now we have to think carefully what we're going to do. The idea of learning from these zoom models, because I'm not going to present these uh, results because the parameters, are, they can be biased. So you won't be able to trust, uh, in this case, it's frequently the p-values that come from those, uh, from those numerical outputs. But the thing is, uh, you have to, um, before you feed alternative models, you also... Uh, you also need to think uh, which component uh, of those problems that you are encountering will have the first opportunity to, sh to, to, uh, to deal with. Because for instance, do we really have seed inflation? Well, apparently at one particular distance value, I'm not able to explain those zeros. But the other thing you have to think is when you do your model validation, maybe when you have multiple plots with lots of zeros, especially in a row, that can also be an indication for spatial correlation. Or if you have a temporal aspect in your data, if you have uh, lots of zeros sequentially in time, that also can indicate that you have an autocorrelation function. So maybe you can also have nonlinear patterns based on the plots that we've seen when you were looking at residuals versus a covariate effect. So what I'm saying is that you're not going to start building up a model with all the complexity at the time. The idea is to go a step by step and from every model that you're feeding, you disentangle all these components and that will allow you to know how we're going to uh, build up the next follow-up analysis. Maybe you have to do seed inflation, but maybe you have to go into the corner of uh, GAMS, nonlinear patterns. Maybe you have to go to the corner of uh, say, um, spatial correlation. So the alternative distribution, if I have that, if, if I can see that the range that Poisson is showing us in those uh, three-dimensional pictures, if, if that is not enough, maybe the alternative is to deal with a different distribution. Maybe you have to rely on the negative binomial. So you have to do a negative binomial GLM or a GP GLM. In that case, again, I refresh a memory of the formulas. The, the link function is the same mu equal e to the power, lock link for both scenarios. 
And the only thing is that we, thanks to the data, the data will ensure that we're going to make those, um, we're going to have those curves wider and wider. So uh, it's a matter of implementing these competing models, do a detailed model validations, and learn from these, again, new submodels, and see later on what is the, what the follow-up or what the final analysis uh, is going to be. Perhaps in this case, uh, if I remember well, for this specific uh, puffing data, GP model was doing the job. Um, finally, if you, uh, because Alain is going to do the SIP, so we, uh, not only need the Poisson, GB, and negative we also need the uh, Bernoulli distribution, the GLM Bernoulli. So you have to be familiar with this uh, final leg as well. So in this model formulation, I convert everything in present absence. So the first line of code is doing everything as a zero one. That's your new response. So it's a vector with zeros and ones. And we say that uh, we'll call nest zero one. Uh, that Y data is going to follow a Bernoulli distribution with parameter pi, expected values pi, variance is given by that expression. And now we're going to use a different link, a logic link. So pi is equal e to the power intercept plus beta times covariate divided one plus e to the power, et cetera, et cetera. That link, new link, will ensure, the logic link will ensure that everything that you're going to get as theta that will be bounded between zeros and ones because the probability is always between zero and one. And uh, so this is the model I can implement. As you as you can see, I changed the scenario here. I'm not using distance to the, the edge. I'm using the percentage of grass. But anyway, that I'm feeding model with only one covariate. This is a GLM with, um, what is that, Bernoulli distribution from the software point of view with typing in family binomial, but this is present absence. And this is the numerical output. So you have the uh, estimated parameters to fit your, uh, to get your eta component and later on do e to the power divided one plus e to the power. Classical, this is classical logistic regression models. So you will have a sigmoid kind of sigmoid curves, zeros and ones. So in this case, the, the larger the, the, the grass cover, the higher the probability of finding uh, nest. So we need both components to build up later on a, a SIP model. So hopefully this was uh, was meant to be a short this revision of uh, Poisson, Neri, Binomial, GP, and Bernoulli, and the implementation of the corresponding GLMs before you jump into the uh, SIP themselves. Thank you, Elena. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um... I see a heart fl floating over the screen. <laughs> Where's that coming from? Okay. Um, SIPs. The world of zero inflated models. Count data. Um, if we were to do count data and continuous data, it would uh, even be longer than what it's going to be today. But I will try to give you some, uh, some hints for uh, continuous data. Um, so what can we do with uh, count data with plenty of zeros? Uh, and assuming that your covariates are not going to help you to model the zeros. Uh, you've got zero inflated Poisson models, we call them ZIPs, and uh, you have zero altered Poisson models, ZAPs. And uh, there was a time we, do, we would do both. Um, but I think zips are easier to understand and explain. And the other problem with zaps, what, what do you do in a zap? You first analyze the data as uh, absence, absence presence using a Bernoulli, and then you dump all the zeros and you model the presence only data. And then in step three, you combine that. Problem is that if you dump all the zeros and you apply a, a new model on the data without the zeros, yeah, sometimes you don't have much data left. So the type of models that you then can apply in terms of complexity, modeling dependency, random FX, spatial correlation, et cetera, is, is, is quite often very limited. So that's the reason we're not a really fan of uh, zero altered Poisson models and their negative binomial uh, cousins. So today is going to be zip and the negative binomial uh, version of that, zero inflated negative binomial. And yes, you can also do the GP version of it. So zip, Z-E-N-B, 
ZIGP. And um, I, I always think that the best way to understand a new model is to simulate some data because then you can keep it simple. There's not too much noise. Um, we all know what we have. So simulate. And then once we've done this presentation, we can take a real data set and then dive into the real problems. And as Alina said, never start with a zero inflated model. First, try an ordinary GLM, like a Poisson GLM, and then uh, apply it, model validation, and see what is wrong. That is probably the best approach. Um, don't transform your count data and then apply linear re regression. Wharton et al. gave you a nice uh, presentation on that, nice paper. And on top of that, uh, even if you transform data, you're still going to get a problem that there are a lot of observations with the same value. So it's not going to help you at all. So forget about a square root transformation or a log y plus one. It doesn't help you. Uh, let's do a conceptual explanation of zero inflated Poisson models. Now, Elena, you did the uh, Bernoulli one. Uh, the Bernoulli GLM. And what did you do? You modeled absence presence of puffin nests. Yeah, I, I keep on talking about puffins, but it's not puffins, it's puffin nests. The nest, the nest. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. Anyway, and it's I nice... consider, I know what you're going to say. I consider one a success and zero as failure. Yeah. So one is presence, one is success, and zero is failure. And then you model pi, the probability of success, as a function of covariance. In this case, grass uh, coverage or something like that. Now, in the zip story, we're going to change that. We're going to change the definition of the pi. It's slightly confusing. Uh, all what we do, we consider zero as success. So this is absence. That's going to be success. And that is going to be failure. We'll just flip them around. Just technical thing. Uh, and that means that a large pi, large say 0.9, means a high probability of not having any puffin nest in a plot. Now, what did you do, Elena? You modeled uh, a, um, you, you actually had absence presence, absence presence, and you modeled that as a function of a covariate. You mm -hmm. can either plug in covariates or in this zip storyline, maybe you want to keep it simple for the moment and don't plug in any covariates because it is already difficult enough. And if you're going to add covariates in your Bernoulli part, you're only going to get more dizzy. Now, I will show you in the OWL example how you can actually recognize that you may want to consider plugging in covariates in there. But the easiest thing to start with is covariates in your count part and just a, a, a constant in your um, Bernoulli part. You don't have to, but it makes your life a little bit easier. So then I thought, how can I simulate something? Well, if you simulate, you choose regression parameters. So I chose an intercept of 0.5. And how much is e to the power 0.5 uh, divided by one plus e to the power 0.5, that is 0.62. So the probability of absence, 0.62. And why did I choose that? Because I wanted to have more zero. I wanted to have an excessive number of zeros. 0.62 is pi. So if you want to memorize that, or memorize the 0.5, I just choose it. Here yeah, I'm actually doing it in R. Pi is, uh, is 0.62. Then what I want to do, I want to simulate zeros and ones. I just pretend to go to the field and sample thousand plots. So thousand times I'm going to uh, simulate a zero or a one. And I can use our binom for that. And if you say size is one, it means you flip a coin only one. So a, a binomial becomes a Bernoulli. I just need to fool our binom because our binom thinks that uh, that one is success. So if you do one minus pi, you just make sure that you're going to get more zeros in this case than, than ones. So you can see that. 
So with that random seed, uh, nearly 600 times a zero and 400 times a one. Okay, I could simulate that. Now, why would I do that? Um, let's say we also got counts. Actually, that, that's what you have. You have counts, numbers of nests per plot. The next thing I want to do is simulate count data with lots of zeros. Now, I'm going to use a Poisson distribution for that, but I need to fool this Poisson distribution uh, in, in some way that I have excess of number of zeros. Now, how can I do that? Well, look, this part, you've seen that. Logit pi is, uh, was it 0. 0.5? And I'm going to use uh, log mu is an intercept plus covariates. Choose what you want. And nest is Poisson distributed. And here's my little trick. I am doing mu times W, where that W thing is the one I just simulated. So mu times a vector with zeros and ones. Here's your model. Um, let me choose an intercept of minus 0.1 and a slope of 0 0.05. And I'm using 1,000 uh, so like plots, so I need 1,000 distance values. Just choose them nicely. Uh, you can either simulate them random from a uniform distribution or just nicely as a sequence. So now I got my mu. How do I get my count data? R plus thousand values where the mean is mu times w. Mu times w. Okay. What is the trick here? If you simulate from a Poisson distribution where the mean is zero, then your simulated value is also zero. So wherever you are zero, your simulated value is zero. So all the Ws that are zero will give me a zero for my count. That's how I simulate a count data with a lot of zeros. Let me then combine the data. So I just call that zip data. Uh, I got my distance and my number of nests. So this is actually what you would sample in the fields. You don't have that W and you don't have that mu. You don't have the intercept, neither do you have the slope. That is what you want to estimate. Yeah, this is what you measure, distance and nests. Now, if I plot that data, look, this is what I have. And those of you who got zero inflated data may, may start to recognize things because every time I see zero inflated data, it looks, look, big band of zeros there. And then these are your non-zeros. And a massive spike at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at zero, simulated data. Let me just plug in everything together. So I call this fantasy. Uh, it's a data frame. I got my plot number. I got my covariate. I got my simulated W, my mu, W times mu, and the nest. So again, distance and nest are real. The rest is just made up to simulate. You don't sample, see, you don't know the W, the mu, you estimate them with a, a zip model. Okay, let me um, uh, apply this then. So a zip distribution. In the same way that Elena said nest is Poisson distributed, I can say nest is zip distributed. Now the zip distribution got two parameters the mu and the pi. And yes, I will show that distribution in a moment. I can again have my vertical uh, bars. Now, if you take a pen and paper and you write out the expression of the mean and the variance, just take for granted that this is what you will get. So if you were to know the mu, the mu and the pi, then this is your expected value and this is your variance. Why do you need the variance? just in case if you want to calculate Pearson residuals. And what do we do with the mu? You are e to the power and intercept plus beta times distance. And pi, let's keep it simple, uh, an intercept only. What would happen if pi is, uh, is zero or close to zero? Then, then, then um, 
you're going to get a poisson. If you're gone, you're back to the expressions that Elena showed you. Poisson, the mean is the variance. Will be your nested. Yeah. Yeah. How can you fit a um, a um, zero inflated uh, Poisson model? Well, you can either use PSCL, uh, and, and the, the syntax is, is uh, zero in nest is an intercept. You don't have to write one. You can just omit it. Uh, plus, you can variate vertical line, and this is your uh, your your Bernoulli part, an intercept only. You want to use GLMM TMB so that in a moment we can add random FX because that one can't do random FX. So that is the reason we're doing GLMM TMB. Uh, this is your your uh, count part. ZI formula is an intercept only. Family is Poisson, negative binomial, GP, etc. Beta, that's all possible. Here's the output. Uh, conditional model, this is your count part. And you got an intercept, an estimated intercept goes there. You got an estimated slope, very similar to what I simulated or what I chose for my simulation. And I've got an intercept for my uh, for my uh, Bernoulli part. Yeah, that's all very nice because it's simulated. So what do you do next, Elena? What's the first thing that you do after fitting a I was checking the dispersion? You check checking your own dispersion. dispersion. So I'm following the same red line that Elena was doing, except my distribution is different. But my working steps, working steps are identical. So give me residuals. Yeah, I, I don't know when, when I made this crazy uh, presentation. At that time, it says, uh -uh, I'm not going to do it for you. I think it is still saying the same thing, GLMM, TMB. But there will be a point in time when it will do um, it will do that for you. Now, I have to do it manually. I need to calculate 1 minus pi times, uh, times the, the mu from the uh, count part. So how do you do that? Well, get an X matrix. So this is the point where you really have to actually do all these things yourself. Look what I'm doing here. Get an X matrix. I got my betas. Because it is GLMM TMB, you have to do dollar sign conditional. X times beta e to the power. That is your mu from your count part. How do you get that uh, that uh, that uh, the estimated intercept from the Bernoulli? Uh, just look it up. This is how you find it. Dollar sign zi. You got your pi. If you got the pi and you got the mu, look what I do. It, these are your expected zip values. The variance. Pearson residuals, and then it is take the Pearson residuals, square them, add them all up, divide by n minus p. That is hopefully one. Yeah, in this case, it is actually very close to one, but that is because it is simulated data. And, and you're going to get the same problem if it is for, for real data, because you're going to get 1.5, 1.6, .6, When is that actually good when it is not good? Well, I don't know. Why don't you simulate 1,000 data sets? And, uh, and and then for each simulated data set, you, um, you, you calculate the dispersion statistic. Either simulate and hope that that works okay, or you dive into the vegan package and you grab that function uh, that will simulate uh, zero inflated uh, count data for you. So now you've got thousand simulated data sets and for each you calculate yeah, whatever you want. Uh, what about a dispersion statistic? Voila. In this case, it seems that the dispersion statistic that we found uh, for our uh, model and data uh, complies with those uh, thousand simulated ones. You don't have to take the dispersion statistic. You can calculate anything from your simulated data set and compare that to what you want to do with your simulated data. In fact, look who's there, DHRMA. DHRMA is calculating a slightly different uh, dispersion statistic. It's not the one that I showed you before. It's a different one. So don't get confused if you are going to use DHRMA and that the dispersion statistic has a different value. So DHRMA is doing all that simulation for you. 
And I will show you that in the R code in a moment. And why would you use DHRMA? Well, if you have count data with lots of uh, values that are the same, lots of zeros, lots of ones, lots of twos, lots of threes, fours, fives, then model validation becomes a bit of an art. And in the most extreme case, that would be Bernoulli data. And then you have to use, uh, you better use uh, DHR model. Other than that, nothing too worrying. Well, I'm, I'm bluffing a little bit in here. This is truly zero inflated data, but it is already difficult to do a model validation here. And, and look at that. This is observed data versus fitted uh, data and, and is not on that one-to-one -one line. So memorize that or, or remember that because in a moment I'm going to, uh, to focus on, on this. Now a zero inflated model, they are designed to cope with zero inflation. I haven't seen one single zero inflated model that, wouldn't, that, that wasn't able to cope with the zero inflation, which explains why the, uh, what was it Elena, 62% uh, of zeros? I think yeah. so, 62 percent of zeros, model can, can easily cope with that. Okay. Um, zero inflated fossil model visualization. Look who's here. This is your mu from the, the, the uh, count parts, mu pos. That straight line there. That's your pi. Remember, pi was constant. And how do I get how do I get the uh, the mean values of the zip? You do one minus pi times that one, and that will give you this. So what I'm showing here here is a cloud of non-zero data. Yet the fitted values here of the zip are in no man's land. Well, that's odd, isn't it? Yeah, well, did we not say that uh, these negative binomial distributions, they, they're not in the center, they're not necessarily, the mean value is not necessarily in the center of the data. It sits in the middle, not in the middle, uh, somewhere in the middle. So how does that then work? Uh, and go, going back one, and then people say, yeah, I'm only interested in that one. No. You can't dump the zeros. If you want to make predictions, it's really from that line. These are your, your zip expected values. Sorry, Alain, before you move on to interrupt, and it, it looks as if you have four lines, but in reality, at the bottom, you have the zeros, okay? Those are oh, yeah, the zeros there too. Yeah, the zeros are there. A little bit of jittering. Now, look at this, this here. The only the black line, the thick black line there, that is the zip average. Here you can see the Poisson. Do you see that? That is Poisson, the, 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 the count part of the, of, of the zip. It's not Poisson. It's the count part of the zero inflated uh, distribution. And then you've got a spike at zero. A spike at zero. And here you've got a Poisson. So it's like the negative binomial. The negative binomial can do something very similar. So a distribution that sits on top of that big black line and that has a spike at zero. But that's all what a zero inflation, a zip distribution is doing. And what would be the zero inflated negative binomial do? A spike at zero, but much wider uh, a much wider distribution for your count data. What would happen if you do a Poisson GLM here? Well, I can do that. Look, GLM family is Poisson. What's the first thing that you do after a, a Poisson GLM? Over dispersion. It's over dispersed, right? so it's not good. Then some people do quasi Poisson, but the problem there is that it will, will come up with very wide confidence intervals to get the zeros and, and that, that data that is far away. Whereas a zip will give much smaller confidence intervals. So a zip is just designed for this type of data. 
and that quasi croissant is not the right thing to do. Now, that is that. Elena, do you mind if we do the story of the true and the false zeros after the OWL presentation, time-wise? Because, yeah, because we're running out of time. Yeah, we're running out of time. Yeah, running out of time, but I can do that late. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, without rushing, I don't want to rush. I want to do a real exercise, and then I'm going to have all these graphs that I I showed to you um, on the real data sets. Elena, would you be able to um, tell a story about the owls? Because you're a biologist, you can do it better than me. Okay, you want me to explain the... Yeah, I'll explain what it is. Yeah, very quickly. I mean, we have 27 nests, owl nests, somewhere in Switzerland. And what we have in the nest, those are chicks. And the chicks are making noise because they're begging for food. And in this case, they quantify a, thir a 30 second intervals of uh, number of noises, number of uh, EOS that they do, um, 15 minutes before the uh, parents arrive to the nest delivering food and they deliver food. So that's the reason why they standardize all the numbers that were counted in a period of 30 seconds. Those are going to be so number of calls, count data, discrete data, those, that is going to be a response. And we're going to have as covariate, we're going to have the arrival time. These animals, they feed during the night from 10 o'clock up to five o'clock. That is your arrival time. Then we have the sex of the parents because both parents are feeding the chicks. And we also have a food treatment consisting of one is one level is, it's a factor with two levels, satiated and deprived. Satiated means that the chicks will rely on two different sources of food and deprived is that they only rely on the food that the parents are going to bring. And that's the reason why we're going to model the number of noises as a function of arrival time, sex of the parents, uh, food treatment, and brood size, which is the number of uh, chicks in the nest. That can but be then I wanted to keep it simple. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, then go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, owls, uh, load the packages. I don't want to spend too much time on all the ins and outs of, of the R code. It is well documented, I think. So, number of calls is your response. Convert uh, the coordinates from Swiss to, uh, to uh, data that you can put in ggmap. There's a time element in there as well. Where are we? Switzerland. Near a lake. Yeah, so every dot is a nest. Uh, what do we have? Number of calls. So this is the number of calls during the night. 27 nests. 26% of zeros, something like that. Lots of zeros. 26, data, 26. Yeah. yeah, the data goes from zero to 30. And the rest uh, looks okay-ish. There is no collinearity. Now, this is an important one. This is your number of calls against arrival time. It is not linear, as you can see. And why would it be linear? Now keep in mind you're doing either the power relationships, but at the very end of this solution file, I will tell you, repeat everything with a G-A-M-M. -M. The nest effects, 27 nests. It is in fact time series data. What we're going to do a random effect nest to model the dependency uh, inside a nest. We have 26% of zeros. So how do you start Poisson GLM? It's the same Poisson GLM that Elena talked before, except random effect nest to take into account dependency. You run it. I have only 10 minutes left. You run it. What's the first thing that you do after fitting a Poisson GLM, Elena? Check. 
support the uh, dispersion study. Yeah, check for all dispersion. Uh, look, there's a function test dispersion that does that for you. It is okay-ish. That's okay-ish. Uh, was this DHR map test dispersion? I think it is. Yeah, that is DHR map. Yeah. So just, just, just. Yeah. Can you cope with the zeros? No. Oh, look, it can't cope with the zeros. So this is not knock uh, zero inflated. But before we do that, give me those residuals and plot them against every covariate in the model and check them, in this case, versus arrival time. And look, you've got no linear patterns in here. So you've got zero inflation and you've got a nonlinear arrival time effect. If you want at this point and jump into a GAM, go ahead. Homework, do a complete model validation. I want to show you that, that, uh, that um, 3D graph. So how do I uh, plot the fitted values? Give me 50 values for arrival time for every level of sex parent food treatments and predict. And voila, here are your fitted values. And what is the, the, the Poisson distribution doing here? And now it's interesting. So it's a bit of fancy code. So I'm going to pick upon this one and I am going to superimpose those Poisson density curves on top, on top of it. So for female deprived, ugly codes, very ugly codes, plot 3D, blah, blah, blah. Take for granted. There you are. Oops, come back. So what you see here is a Poisson distribution. And it tells you, I don't like these zeros. It doesn't like it. it, it, it the, the, they don't comply with that distribution. Or the distribution doesn't comply with the data. That's probably what I should say. So it's not only that you want to have a nonlinear red line, but you also want to have something else for that distribution. Then what is the code doing? The code says, the DR code, uh, it goes on with a negative binomial. Yeah, of course, it's got to get wider. And then it says, let's do a zero inflated distribution. And all what that is doing, it puts a spike at zero. It's exactly that it's the only thing it does. Yeah, so a spike at zero. And of course, these things get a little bit smaller because the, the sum of that distribution has to be one. But that is the effect of your zero inflated uh, distribution. Elena, what, 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 shall, what else shall I show of this? I mean, it's, it's pretty well explained. Wrong approach, negative binomial. Look, and binom two does that. Maybe the model, maybe the model fate of the uh, final. Let me show you the, the yeah. actual zip model. Exactly. Now, this is copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. What is the negative binomial distribution doing? Of course, you're going to get the same problem, nonlinear patterns. You're going to get wider confidence bands now, but superimpose the negative binomial distribution on there. And they should be wider. Yeah, they get Look, wider. this is a negative binomial distribution. Yeah, they, they do allow for the zeros, Maybe I should have picked upon one of these other ones because here it actually indicates that zero inflation is okay. But if you do a test, it tells you, uh-uh, I don't like the zeros. Yeah, okay. If you don't like the zeros, I will give you a zero inflated distribution. Look who's here. Zip. This is the same model that you've seen twice now, except I've added a random effect. How do you do it? As before, ZI formula is an intercept. Plus your random effect nest. And let me then show you how that works out. Summary M3, you're going to get your estimated intercept like for the, the, the was it the puffin, uh, the count parts, the Bernoulli parts, you combine them, et cetera, et cetera. Model validation. Of course, this thing now tells you 
zero inflation or problem. And um, it still has nonlinear patterns. So this is definitely a GAM. Fitted values. Let me show you the uh, the, uh, the 3D picture. Because yeah, that that's is the one probably, yeah. yeah, there you can see it. There's a lot of code. There's only problem here that this is quite uh, a quite fancy code. So you got your, your fitted values. Yeah, what is the zip distribution doing? Pick one of these. And there we go again, 3D picture. I say go so. Look, looks very similar to your Poisson, but it has a spike at zero. And by my question, and that is probably the last question I'm going to ask. How would you now know that you could put it around with that pi? Because I'm using pi as a constant in the Bernoulli part. So that thing is constant. How can you allow that, for example, for deprived female, you have a difference in spike compared to, to here? Because you can see you got more, more zeros here than, than there. So maybe at this point, maybe if you want to increase the complexity of the model, allow for a covariate like sex parent or food treatment in the Bernoulli parts, because then you allow for a difference between treatments in the height of that line. Phew, Elena, I, I think that the best thing is to, to not go any deeper in this. Uh, it does a zero inflated negative binomial, but I guess you get the picture. You get extensions, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, it compares them all. And at the very end, the very, very, very end, look who's here, a gam. Why is it a gam? Because you really have a nonlinear rival time. Rival time. And why is that? Parents come with food, chicks make noise, they eat. And what do you do after you eat? Be quiet. You be quiet. You go for sleep. And then they go. After a while, you wake up. You make noise. You get noisy again. That's what the, the biology is, of this is. So the whole story starts over again. Start with a Poisson GMM. Check for all dispersion, zero inflation, etc. But as you, as I was making those preliminary comments, we go slowly, step by step. And we learn from every sub model until we, we get the final one. Why would you do that? Because a smoother may fight with the zeros, with the zero inflation component. And by the way, you also got spatial correlation here. Exactly, because those nests, if they are close to one another, the main interact parents may be competing for food. So there may be correlation between the nests as well. So that's the reason why it may get as complicated as you want, but you need to deal with all these components. Uh, step by step. All right. So thank you, uh, Elena and Elaine. Uh, I think we, we have time for uh, a couple of questions. It's almost uh, 1.30. So I'm going to, uh, I'm here at Paul everywhere. I'm looking at the questions that were voted um, or upvoted. So the first question is, how do we choose from zero inflated Poisson or negative binomial when we can see that there is a zero inflation problem? If a Poisson is over dispersed and if it can't cope with the zeros, then it's either negative binomial or zero inflated or, or a zip. How do you choose between them? The negative binomial would most of the time allow for more variation in your count data. In the counts. So if there's also, if there's not only zero inflation, but also large variation in data, okay. then most of the time it's going to be negative binomial. It doesn't happen very often that we end up with a zero inflated negative binomial because that is a massive cannon to shoot a mosquito, a fly. Yeah, so... Sometimes you have to gamble a little bit. Is it a zip? Is it a negative binomial? If possible, keep it simple with a zip uh, because negative binomial, uh, 
although there are a few papers that actually argue that a negative monomial tends to be better. Great. Um, the other question is, is generalized Poisson distribution similar or different from the quasi-Poisson in RGLM? I don't know RGLM, so I can't answer the question, but I do know that a generalized Poisson is a real distribution. It's a real model. Whereas quasi-Poisson, is it, there's no distribution. It's just that you, no. you blow up the standard errors. It's a and, quick and dirty solution to, to, yeah, to blow up the yeah, standard and, errors. And then the other thing is in that when you do GLM, yes, you can do quasi-Poisson, but what do you do if you've got spatial correlation and you want to move towards INLA where you don't have that option? So then, then you have to go for a GP or a Poisson or for negative binomial. So in all those years that we've done stats, we've never done quasi uh, quasi. Yeah. Uh, and besides, uh, Alain, it's, it can be complicated if you have too many covariates and if you want to enter in the world of doing model selection as well. So um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, gotta... that's the reason why we try to stay away from uh, quasi quasi Boisson. Mm -hmm. But maybe right. other people got different opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, there's a question here. What can we do with zero inflated proportion data? Proportion, that is also uh, an interesting one. If your proportion okay. is 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.1, you are in the world of a beta distribution. And a beta distribution, you can also extend that to zero inflated uh, beta or one inflated beta, beta or zero and one inflated beta. That is all possible. Uh, if you are, so that, that, that would be the, the beta uh, uh, root. If your data is uh, 10 fish die out of a batch of 20, then it's binomial. Binomial, yeah. So in that case, I would suggest that you go the binomial route. So there's a, there's a very fine line, actually it's not fine, line, it's a quite clear line that says this is beta, that's binomial. Yeah. But both of them have extensions towards uh, zero inflated uh, 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 yeah. examples. Mm -hmm. And, and there are plenty of papers out there that will give you the mean and the variance of a zero inflated uh, a beta. And, and we actually went through all this, uh, this zero inflated beta stuff in 90, what is it, 2014, 2015. We did that with JAX. That was a nightmare to do. Oh, yeah. Whereas yeah. nowadays, you can do that in GLMM TMB. Very, very nice, very fast. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think related to that, uh, one of the questions that has been upvoted here is, uh, and, and I think you mentioned briefly about that of using the alternatives for continuous variables, which also have zero inflation. So uh, you were mentioning the, the beta uh, regressions with uh, zero or one inflated uh, data, but then what to do with other types of continuous variables that have zero inflation and the question even asks if the Tweedy distribution uh, is a good choice. Yeah. You want to answer that, Elena? Yeah, the, 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 the Tweedy distribution is a, is a very good option. The alternative is that you do, uh, you use in the same way that we use Poisson versus Bern and Bernoulli, we can use Bernoulli and for the continuous, uh, for the continuous part, we can use a gamma distribution. But that is, that is pretty much what is driving the present absence and once the animals or once the system is there, what is driving the abundance. The real, and then you use the gamma, but gamma has the limitation that is for non-zero data. So it's continuous data, positive, excluding the zero. Okay. So in a combination with a Bernoulli, then you can do a zero inflated, zero inflated model for continuous data. That is one option. The limitation is that if depending on the sample size and depending on the number of zeros, when you split up the data into present absence and the presence only, maybe the presence only, we have only a few observations and then you're not allowed to include too many covariates. And there's where probably Tweety is, is better. So it depends on this scenario, but both uh, options can be available for analyzing zero inflated continuous data. Elena, in our zero inflation course, did we not say 
your options are Tweety, as you say, and your your um, your gamma possibility. But the Tweety will the, the the shape of the Tweety distribution is very similar, although it's continuous. But if you, it's very similar to that zip with a spike at zero, so the, the Tweety can look very similar. But the Tweety would not allow you to write a story around your zeros. So exactly. if you got plenty of zeros, what is the Tweety doing with that? Yeah, a, a spike at zero. Whereas the, the Bernoulli plus gamma in that approach, which is called a hurdle model approach. The hurdle model, yeah. In that approach, because you've got your Bernoulli part, the, the Bernoulli leg of that model, your zeros can actually tell your story. Exactly. So what you can say, you can explain what is driving the present absence and then what is driving the presence. That is, from that point of view, it's probably better if you want to disentangle these two different components. But as I said, there is also a disadvantage. It depends sometimes when you split up the data, you have only a very small number of observations in the non-zero data. Mm -hmm. And that can be an issue as well. Just apply so, them both and uh, do it. Yeah, really exactly. That's what we do. And, and see yeah. who's got That's to, what who's we do. to tell yeah. what. Yeah. So last question um, that I think we have time for is if you can use a function check over dispersion in the performance package to, to check if the Poisson or negative binomial GLMs uh, are, are, are over dispersed uh, or not, rather than calculating the Pearson residuals dispersion statistics kind of by hand or, or through R. I, I prefer to do it by hand because then I know what, uh, what a package is doing. My, my first encounter with DHRMA, I got utterly confused because it is actually calculating a different test statistic. So I, I really went into the source code of DHRMA and, and try to figure out what exactly the package was doing. And only then I, I was convinced it was the right thing to do. So yeah, with that respect, I trust DHRMA now, but if you ask me about different packages, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you. I haven't used. Uh, well, I do. I did use performance, but I would say double check and look in the source code. Probably see what double it check. Does. Yeah, probably double, double check. check. Yeah. So well, the first time when we started when we started working with these type of models, we tried to in general. Same when we do simulation studies, we try to get a little bit more of uh, control in the in the code we produce. So uh, check both. Yeah, I would say. So I, I, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know. All right, so um, I think for today, uh, that's going to be it. There are uh, many uh, additional questions uh, in poll everywhere, but unfortunately, we won't have time to go over these uh, additional questions. Again, uh, I would like to really thank uh, Dr. Ayeno and Dr. Zur very much for providing this um this introduction to uh, zero inflated uh, models. In particular, I really appreciate that the code is very well documented and it's gonna be a very valuable resource to the community.